Hey y'all, it's uh, Stephen Van Camp and Lewis uh, here at the end of January. Uh, I've got uh, Catacetum hybridizer and breeder extraordinaire Fred Clark here with me today. And we're going to discuss uh, springtime Catacetum care. It seems like this is the time of year when folks who haven't grown that many Catacetums are most likely going to, to kill them. This is sort of the most sensitive time of the year. And so I figured I'd have Fred on to to guide us through uh, what an appropriate spring routine is. You know, like I said, it's the beginning of January. So uh, some folks, especially in Florida, seem to be having their, their catacetums waking up uh, at this time of year. Um, and then just strangely enough, you know, looking around online, it seems like folks in, in from, from West Virginia to Germany are, are having some of their plants waking up too. For some reason, I feel a little left out on a minor waking up. Actually, let's kind of jump into this where we, we start off, where we talk about a wake-up routine for healthy plants. Then we'll talk a little bit about just general tips and tricks, and maybe get into some common examples of how things can go wrong and do go wrong. Um, and at the end, we'll we'll chat a little bit about uh, Fred's upcoming list and, and, and what types of things uh, folks who might want to buy from Sunset Valley Orchids uh, can look forward to. So, Fred, how are you? All right, doing good. Good. Nice to be nice to be back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's been about a year, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. So it has been. Yeah. I know we. Yeah, it's about February last time. Yeah, yeah, and then and then I I know you get pretty busy around March with the the shows and stuff, right? Well, you know, I have another job, believe it or not. So I do my orchid thing, but I also manage a place called the Flower Fields. And the uh, Flower Fields is. Uh, this is our shirt that we're gonna. All our employees are gonna be wearing this year. Is uh, it's a large cut flower operation in Southern California in Carlsbad. It's near San Diego, and uh, it's uh, 55 acres of ranunculus, and we grow and sell ranunculus flowers. But there's a lot of flowers in bloom, and we have the public come tour through the fields. So it's a, quite a floral experience. We'll have 250. Maybe even 300,000 people will visit uh, each season to the flower fields. And that happens in March, April, and May. And I'm one busy guy uh, right then. So that is that is interesting uh, that, that orchids are just one of several things that you do. And it seems like there are, you're not the only one out there. And maybe I'll make a, a show and a chat with you about your, your other stuff. And, you know, maybe like Frank Smith and some of the other folks, some of the mm-hmm. hybridizers or who are, who are multitaskers, I guess. Yeah, yeah. All right, so anyway, so catacetums. So most of you, right, should have your catacetums dormant by now or well into dormancy. I, I get a lot of questions right about now from a lot of indoor growers about why their plants aren't dormant. Uh, and so uh, if your plants aren't dormant, that means you need to brush up on some culture stuff you need to adjust the day length and shorten the day length on your plants you need to cool them off and back off on your watering frequency in november and december in order to have your plants dormant by now but uh so for those of you who have your plants that are dormant a lot of folks start to see new growth emerging right about now in fact here i've got quite a few plants with little little half inch quarter inch green nubs sprouting out at the base of some of my plants. Some are bigger and some are smaller and some have none yet. Each plant's an individual, and so they start growing at uh, at their unique times, uh, individual to each plant. The uh, interesting thing is, is that we always say, is you don't begin to water until the new growth has new roots that are three to eight inches long. That's going to take about two months in most cases from now. Uh, Folks in the southern part of the country, like in Florida, have much milder and warmer weather, and they see their plants sprouting, growing, and producing roots well before the rest of us do, typically. And so um, I like to repot because that's really the question, right? Is what do you do when you start to see new growth now? So you want to wait to water if you're not repotting until you have uh, the roots and the growth the right length. But you also, if you need to repot, now's the time to repot with the beginning of those new growths. And uh, if you have 
uh, some plants that you bought from me in the three inch pots last season. Uh, the Probably the best technique is just to add more moss around the existing and then slip pot the whole thing up into a four inch pot. There's no need to to remove the old moss on those. It's still new. It's only a year old moss, so it's it's fine. Two year old moss is fine. For those uh, of you, yeah. I, I was gonna say what so you know, not so holding off on that watering until the roots are are, you know, this long-ish, uh can be difficult. And, and I I get that question a lot. It's like, why do we need to do that? Why why don't I just start watering? When the new roots are, are starting to poke out. Yeah. And so, well, that's a good question. And, you know, and, and it took me a long time to come up with this answer and and to be confident in the answer that I'm giving to is. And it, it really required uh, several visits to seeing plants in nature, uh, trips to Venezuela, Mexico, Costa Rica, and different areas in the spring. And you see catacetums growing. And I always want to go see catacetums when I go on uh, trips to those areas. And and so in the springtime, it's usually the dry season in Central and Latin America. And the dry season is when the new growth start. And I have seen plants with new growths that are, you know, several inches long and new roots that are four to 10 inches long. I mean, pretty long roots. And you ask people, the guide or, or the folks who live in the area, when do the rains start? And they, oh, no, not for another month. And so uh, this is when I started to realize this, that the plants grow their roots, not because of rainfall. They grow their roots in anticipation of rainfall. And so this is a very clear distinction um and uh, once you understand it then of course it's easier to to do <laughs> to do it and so yes. um catacetum roots don't overwinter well most of the roots uh stop functioning after the first year you get a couple roots that hold on but not many it's really the new roots that are going to do all the work the new roots are going to replace the old root system and you need the new roots because the new roots are going to pick up the moisture and the nutrients and you only get one flush of roots a year. And so you need to really babysit those, that flush of roots each season. And so uh, waiting to water until the roots elongate is important. If you water your plant too early, I think it sends a message to the plant that the rainy season already started. So growing roots isn't that important now. It's already past that season because you're sending you're sending signals to the plant because it's wet. What the plant is used to feeling in nature is that it's dry. And as long as it's dry, the plant says, wow, I need to keep producing roots. I need more roots. I need more roots. So I have a big root system that's ready to pick up nutrients and moisture when those rains come. Remembering that catacetums live in a, in a semi-deciduous environment. Most do. And so they have seasonal wet and dry period. And so nutrients and moisture are only available for a short period of time in the summer. And so the plants produce these roots in anticipation of the access to these materials. And when they're there, they pick them up and they grow fast and and so you want to make sure that you follow this so your plant is capable of doing that so you can have a nice big plant with big pseudobulbs and have lots of flowers. Yeah, yeah and, and I do want to really emphasize something you said is, is that, you know, they're they're just they're really well adapted for throwing those roots out uh, before the rain comes. And then if you do water uh, significantly, those roots abort. And like you said, if the, that season's roots abort, you know, the other roots from last season are going to die off and, and your plant is going to be in, in a difficult limp, situation. It's just going to limp along. Yeah. may not die, but you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be a phenomenal catacetum grower. And and I want you to be a phenomenal catacetum grower. Um, you know, yeah. that's kind of the purpose of all this, right? Is you want to 
figure out how to grow those plants the best you can so you can bloom them really good. And when you really grow catastetums well, yeah, it's not uncommon to see a plant bloom three, four times a year. And uh, I, I love that about them. That's yeah. part of the, the thing that we do in breeding is we pick plants that we see this characteristic and we breed them with other plants that have that characteristic. So I know genetically, and many of our hybrids, that is in the background. So once you grow them good, you unlock that potential and have plants that bloom for you, you know, multiple times a year. And and it seems like, you know, so the species tend to be a little more, I guess, finicky or or sensitive to having that mm -hmm. early water, whereas the the hybrids, the the especially the complex hybrids seem to be a little more forgiving of getting water that's uh, may, maybe too early. Can, can yeah. you talk about that for a sec? Well, I agree with that to, in some degree. You know, species have evolved, you know, or catastetums have evolved for about 10 million years when, when the first catastetums, you know, branched off from cymbidiums and so forth way back in the millions of years ago. And so, and they've evolved in this uh, environmental conditions. And so species have evolved in a very specific and very narrow kind of environmental conditions. And so, you really have to, species are always harder to grow than hybrids. When you make a hybrid, you're combining species from two different environmental conditions and the offspring embody the characteristics of, of both of those uh, growing conditions, just like the flowers and the stems and so forth. And then when you make another hybrid, another hybrid, uh, catacetum hybrids are easier to grow than catacetum species, just generally. Um, I would say though that it's really important to watch out for that early watering. Don't don't be in a hurry to water. In fact, you know, if you were sitting there and you were looking at your plant and you go, oh, I think I'll water. It's probably better to wait an extra couple weeks than it is to water a couple weeks earlier. It's not going to bother the plant. The plant really doesn't care. The plants evolved, you know, to, to really deal with that. And, uh, you know, I was... Uh, uh, where, I guess I was in Venezuela a few years ago, and we saw some plants that had been growing for decades. And huh. you could count the number of pseudobulbs, and you could see how old they were. And you could look, and you could see over that 10-year period that that plant really never suffered a problem with water storage in the pseudobulbs. And so they're they've evolved to deal with the inconsistencies of irrigation that mother nature provides. And so if you wait extra week to water your plants or an extra couple of weeks, they're perfectly adapted to deal with that. And yeah. And so, so to kind of come back to that point of, of different types can be a little more, more forgiving or less forgiving. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like, the, the catacetum species are sort of in the middle with the complex hybrids being much more forgiving. But then the Mormides and Cycnikes seem to commit suicide on a semi-regular basis, even, even for, um, for long time growers. What, what do you think it is about those that make them a little more sensitive and, and how do you kind of overcome that for your collection? Yeah. Well, the Mormodes and uh, Cygnoche species are, you know, they're pretty challenging to grow usually. And a lot of times it's it's not that they're hard to grow. It's just that they're misunderstood how they grow. So I was in uh, um, I was in Guatemala in the Coban area, and there was Cygnoche's ventricosum growing on these mm -hmm. trees. And it was just hundreds and hundreds of plants on these on these trees in this area. And uh, none of the plants had more than two pseudobulbs. Hmm. And these had been growing on these trees for the age of the tree. I know the tree was a hundred year old tree or something. And so, and that, uh, so cycnoches aren't clumping plants where they don't form large clumps and have 10, 15 bulbs in a clump. Well, what they do is they grow uh they grow up their mature bulb and then the back bulbs rot off or the or they or i don't know if they rot or or if the plant pulls nutrients from the back row back growth to support its growth i'm not exactly sure what's happening there sometimes you see rot on the plants and other times you see pseudobulbs shrivel away and so uh it's not very common to see a cycnoches with more than three 
or four mature bulbs at a time. And usually if you're if you're feeling pretty cocky that you've got a cyknoches with, you know, four bulbs on it, usually by the next season, you'll be down to one bulb and a new growth. <laughs> uh, because those back bulbs just just shrivel up. And uh, it's not, it's certainly alarming. And I agree, it's a, it alarms me when that happens because, you know, you've worked so hard to grow that plant then just to have it shrivel up. But I've also found that when that happens, I usually uh, repot the plant. I cut off the back portion and then I pot it up into a smaller pot because the root, it's a smaller plant now. And the plant continues to grow and might even grow a bigger pseudo bulb than the one it had the year before. And so it's, it's um, a while ago, I felt that I could help mitigate that loss of back bulbs through breeding. And I was really worked hard selecting plants that uh, the back bulbs persisted longer. Hmm. And so I deliberately, plants that had three and four bulbs on them, those were the one, only ones I would breed with. Anything that would lose its bulb, you know, every year, every other year, I wouldn't breed with those. And I, I, I decided that that was uh, foolish. I it, really wasn't it able work. to, that, it didn't really make a difference. Yeah. Interesting. The, uh, so then the other part was Mormodes. So Mormodes, man, those darn things, they're tricky plants. Um, they're hard to grow. I was in Costa Rica uh, uh, three right before COVID. And uh, it seems funny how we measure time now. Pre-COVID, yeah. right? Yeah. Post-COVID. Yeah. The olden days. <laughs> yeah, the olden days. Yeah. And I was there, and they had a bunch of more Modis uh, at a show there. It was in February, so it was uh, during the dry season. And they were watering their more Modis. They had no leaves on them. And I'm, and I'm well, what, why would you be watering your Marmotis? What's wrong with you guys? And uh, in so in the the species growing in the Alto Plano area around um, San Jose, Costa Rica, mm. um, get some rain in the winter time, January and February. It's not the rainy season, but there are some rains, and so they felt that following what they experienced in nature was. Um, was a good thing to do for the plants under their care and cultivation. And so I made an adjustment with my Mormodes. And so, uh, so right now, if you have, if you're growing Mormodes, you probably have some plants in flower or you just finished flowering your plants. And so although my Mormodes are dormant now, I water them about, oh, maybe every three weeks, one quick watering and I'll do that uh, in January, February, and March. And it's and I'll uh, up until the moment that I see the initiation of new growth. The minute the new growth starts, then I stop watering. It seems as though a little extra moisture during that dormant period for most of the marmotes that I cultivate uh, is help the plants preserve their pseudo bulbs better in dormancy now i'm still just still learning about that myself you know you know how orchids are you get on the path and as soon as you think you know something <laughs> they, tell, they teach you a new lesson you take a and trip so, to costa rica and learn some new stuff <laughs> yeah and so i'm i'm you know I'm, it looks like it's working to me and you know, some of you guys I know subscribed to my newsletter and so forth, and you saw the jar idea and your mm -hmm. and your your PET method with the water in the reservoir. And so, the, although that's hard to have water in the reservoir when the plant is dormant without having water on the roots, there seems as though is maybe more what it is is having enough humidity around the plant during dormancy, um, and so. You know, people who live where it's back east, where it's cold, what, they got eight inches of snow in Minnesota last night. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's pretty cold. The humidity is really low up there. And so catacetums in nature live where it's always humid. It's it's 60, 70 percent humidity or more year round. And when the humidity is 10 percent, it's hard on the plant. So figuring out a way to elevate humidity around the plants can be very beneficial. And this includes, of course, cyknoches and mormodes. 
And, and it seems like that's a good jumping off point really for to expand on that. So the Momorodes, they seem possibly to like a little extra water in that dormant phase. But we can kind of expand that to to the whole group, really. If if your bulbs are are desiccating excessively, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe it does make sense to water the old roots, um, even though they might not be as efficient at pulling up as as incorporating water to the rest of the plant to give them that sort of running head start into that that period when they need to be dry when those new roots are coming out, which is really energy intensive. Yeah. So I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Uh, so there's a couple reasons why a plant would be desiccating during dormancy. Okay. One is you didn't harden it off properly at the end of the growing season. Uh, you know, uh, in nature, the rains just don't stop one day. They taper off. The days get shorter. The nights are cooler and the rains begin to taper off. This this change in the seasonal condition, right? The the day length is shorter, the shorter, cooler nights, and the less rain. Send chemical triggers to your plant to tell the plant, "Hey, the rains are going to end. Winter's coming. Get ready." You know, a bear feeds a, a lot in the fall to fatten up for its winter rest. So your catacetums kind of doing the same thing all summer long. They're fattening up. They're plumping up. And then when winter hits, you need to tell them that and have them harden off so they can be prepared for that winter dormancy. And uh, sometimes, though, if they're not hardened off right, then and you cut off the watering, you'll see them shrivel. And other times, if you have a plant and you have really low humidity, um, you know, a lot of people, interestingly, in Canada grow catacetums. They grow great if they're long summer days it's fantastic how well they grow there but it's bitterly cold in the winter and there a lot of people were getting dehydrated plants because the humidity was so low so um so figuring out how to keep humidity up around the plant can really make a big difference and it could be that one of those techniques that would be effective is to water your plant very sparingly during dormancy you know, uh, I always recommend that you grow in sphagnum moss. I find that that provides the optimal uh, moisture level around the roots. And also it holds a lot of fertilizer ions right on the root system because catacetums are heavy feeders. When sphagnum moss is really dry, it's hard to re-wet. And so uh, you don't want to try to get the rehydrate the moss when you're watering otherwise it'll be sopping wet for weeks and so you just pour maybe an ounce of water through the dry uh, moss and that's usually enough to rehydrate a a plant that that is uh, uh, showing some you know dehydration and maybe two waterings a week apart usually is enough to plump it up Hey, if you found this video helpful, please uh, click this little button down here on the bottom right. And uh, don't feel obligated to, but if you feel like this was worth a dollar or two, please uh, please click that and add a dollar or two. Um, that will really go a long way to me helping to get a greenhouse right over here, as well as head over to Brazil for an orchid trip in 2024. So all of your orchid donations will go to orchid causes Uh, for which I can make additional videos. And as always, thank you very much. It is fascinating how quickly, I mean, it's almost like you can see the bulbs expanding when, when, Mm -hmm. once um, the water hits them after dormancy or during dormancy. Yeah. I took some photos of this, of this phenomenon a while ago, because it was confusing to me because I take a plant and it looked dry and I water it and I come back a day later and I go, where's that plant that's supposed to be dry? Where, who, you know, then I'm looking around for Carlos, you know, my, my, my Carlos Lopez, my work, Carlos, where did you move those plants that were so dry? I didn't touch a thing, you know? <laughs> and so, and uh, so then, you know, we all sat down and we said, okay, here's the plant. We're going to water it once. And then the next day it, uh, it is uh, night, like a night and day uh, effect. Yeah, it really is. And so uh, before we jump into sort of the, uh, maybe the, the problem situations or, or even some, some tips and tricks that you, you've got in the back of your head that we haven't talked about yet. 
The difference between, let's say, the three-inch pots, which are our larger plants, uh, let's say that somebody bought last year, or maybe someone got something small, a real uh, small seedling. Maybe they deflasked. Maybe they just got a real small plant. What's the difference in care this time of year or you know, in spring as it approaches between them and, and the larger, more mature plants? Well, of course, in nature, the care is the same regardless of your age. So yeah. a one-year-old plant gets the exact same treatment as a 10-year-old plant. And so a one-year-old plant can take the treatment that a 10-year-old plant gets and vice versa. Um, so there's a few things. So I have discovered, however, for a higher degree of success, uh, when you deflask plants, you want to do that in March and April may at the latest and this is important because the day length is still increasing then and the chemical message is that the plants receiving from the seasonal variances is that grow 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 it's going to be rainy seasons coming you're going to have lots of nutrients then you then you grow june july august september through the summer you bulk up and you build up your resources that you need for the upcoming dry uh, rest that's going to be occurring. If you pl if you don't start them early enough, you don't build up enough storage to overwinter properly. So, yeah, I say get get stuff out early. And if you have a lot of times, and we talked about this last time, right? Was plants from South America? Yeah, is mm -hmm. you get them and they're out of cycle, and uh, they can be very challenging to to get back into that to that right cycle. And so uh, here you want to keep in mind always that cycling that is happening with your plant. So if you have uh, very small plants, for example, and uh, right now uh, they're dormant. And if you have the wherewithal, you know, you can manipulate the environment around them to optimize your success. And so one of the really effective techniques is to get an electric heat mat. They're inexpensive, they're highly effective, and uh, you can use it in all kinds of ways. Once you have one, it's a it's a it's a powerful tool when mm. properly implemented. So you can take some young plants, put them on a heat mat, and now with LED lights, you know they're cheap and they're effect they don't cost much to use. They don't create any heat. You can fool your plant into thinking that summer is coming sooner than what it really is. Just Run the lights and and uh, give them, you know, right now you could fool your plants and to warm them up, warm them up to 65 degrees at night and turn the lights on. So they've got, I don't know, 14 hours worth of light right now. And that will encourage those younger plants to start growing sooner. And it's helpful to have your plants start growing sooner because then you get a long summer and the longer the growing season uh the more you're going to water and fertilize, the larger and bigger the plants are going to get, the better they're going to flower. And uh, you'll be, you'll have, you know, you'll be an awesome grower. So yeah. you, can, you can manipulate that, but you can go too far. In the fall, you got to remember, they got to go dormant. And, you know, so catacetums have been around about 10 million years. Human beings, we've been around about 300,000 years. And so in your lifetime, just let me, you know, say this so y'all y'all get it. In your lifetime, you will not be able to change how catacetums have evolved to grow. And so what you really need to figure out is how to grow them like they grow in nature. And that way you can optimize the growth and grow the best plants possible. And and in nature, are the the small seedlings, are they are their root systems going to be this long as well? Or or would you start watering? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Smart. That's a good question. So, so when I talk about three to usually I don't sell plants that are smaller than those three inch pots that I sell. And so when I talk about that, I'm talking about when you buy a three inch pot from me and the following year, you want to have roots that are, that are, you know, three to eight inches long. Well, if you have young little plants coming from flask and they got little pseudo bulbs on them that are, you know, an inch tall, as soon as those roots are three inches long, you could start watering. 
a large plant that is in a four inch pot, you would wait for the roots to be coming out the drainage holes to be four to six inches long before you would even think about watering those. Okay. So there, it is a little, there is a relationship there to plant root, plant size, root length and watering. Sure. All right, Fred, before we jump into sort of some problem cases and, and some abnormal wake up routines, is there anything else that, that you think we should cover and any more tips and tricks uh, for this? Well, type of repotting, thing? we could, we, we, you know, so repotting right now is usually a good time. If you see new growth, now is a good time to think about repotting if that's necessary. Uh, the new growth tells you how to orient the plant in the pot properly so you give lots of room in front of the new growth for the new bulbs to grow if you repot before you see new growth you don't know where it's going to start sprouting and so you want to wait to see the new growth so you can orient the plant properly um the uh in catacetums now this isn't true for all orchids but in in catacetums like nochis marmotis cloisas all those new roots follow the new growth and so when you see new growth, you can rest assured that shortly after that, four to six weeks later, you're going to have new roots starting. So if you can repot your plant just at the onset of the new growth, so you know how to orient it, then the plant will grow its new roots into the new media and you won't have any risk of damaging those roots. Mm -hmm. If you repot your plant while the new roots have already come out, it's easy to bust off those green root tips accidentally, of course, because you'd never do that deliberately. Uh, and since, as we said earlier, that the plants only grow one flush of roots a season, you want to make sure you don't you don't damage that root system uh, inadvertently. Because if you do, it really inhibits the plant's ability to grow and flourish for you. Well, it may not die, but it may not thrive like it could have. Yeah, and and snapping off a few of those a few of those new roots is not ideal. But you know, if you've got a whole bunch coming out and you're repotting and you're snapping a whole bunch, you know, you're kind of in yeah. trouble. And, well, and you think about a root, you know, so so how long will a root be? And so if that root's going to be a foot long, two feet long, and you break it off, and you're only going to have I don't know ten roots or fifteen roots on a plant, and you break one off. Ugh, that's a, and you break two off, three off, you know, next thing you know, it's a 10, 15, 20% reduction in your plant's ability to, to pick up moisture and nutrients over its lifetime because of those broken roots. And, you know, you want to give up 15% of your plant's ability to grow. I don't. Yes. So, you, yeah. you can, you, you could even, uh, that'd be a funny experiment where you kind of intentionally snap off some roots and see, see if you can measure how, how, yeah how how much smaller the the new growth is a new bulb is at the end of the year there's a scientist in you coming out yeah <laughs> <laughs> torture the plants for science uh, right, right. <laughs> torture the plants for science yeah, yeah. the uh, uh, and uh, we know it does we know from our own mistakes that it does that it does inhibit it would be interesting to quantify that mm -hmm. uh, some way so Fred, we, you know, I, I want to jump into some sort of some of the more common um, abnormal wake up routines. And we covered one of the ones I want to discuss, which is really, you know, covering the importance of, of keeping those back bulbs fat ish uh, and getting the giving the plant a good run up to the when that 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 new growth is coming out so that it has the resources to uh, to put out that new growth. What happens if if maybe you didn't maybe maybe you you kept with the old mantra of dry, 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 no matter what in, in your plant used up too much of those resources during the dormant period. And maybe it doesn't have enough. Maybe those bulbs are really shriveled and I've done some, some experiments and they can get real shriveled. Um, and it, it, it doesn't get enough. It doesn't still have enough energy to, to continue growing, uh, to pushing out those new roots and that new growth. Should you water? What, what do you do in that case? Well, usually they get all shriveled up like that because they don't have any roots either. And so, um, you know, it's it, it's uh, through a series of previous errors led you to that situation. And so trying to recover from that is um, is really your, is really your question. And so yeah. 
you know, the, the probably the best technique is to, you know, take some sphagnum moss, uh, get it a little moist, wring it out, put it in a plastic bag, throw the bulb in the plastic bag with that moss and zip it shut and put it in a nice warm location. That'll increase the humidity around it. Often on older bulbs, like the ones you're talking about, the eyes that are down near the base uh, have, have all attempted to grow or have failed in some way. And so often an eye farther up the bulb will initiate under those uh, warm, humid conditions. And and usually you, usually you can get a plant to sprout, a, a bulb to sprout up. Um, it was going to be a small plantlet and it might, it'll be like starting a baby plant over. Yeah. And it might take a couple seasons to, to, to bring it back, but you usually can occasionally like on the, you know, you, we were talking about Cygnoches is you'll get a rot on the base of a Cygnoches bulb. If you're quick enough and you cut above that rot, you'll have the tip of that Cygnoches bulb and there won't be any any evidence of rot that's moved up the vascular system above your cut. And if you can cut high enough to get above that, uh, you can let that top piece of the bulb dry out. And very often an eye will sprout on that and uh, you can you know, get a division in effect of the mother plant off that back bulb. And you know, every year I have a plant or two that, that I end up doing that with. So it's uh cabaceans are pretty tough. Remember, you know, all orchids actually they want to live. Their purpose is to live and reproduce. That's what that's what living things do on this planet. Yeah. And so so they're pretty they're pretty robust. And so it's um usually if you have a seriously dehydrated dehydrated pseudobulb, it's because it lost its roots and the environmental conditions have been have been um unnatural for the plant. The humidity has been too low. And so you want to learn from that. And so you don't repeat those mistakes. And if you, you know, happen to have that happen, right, that's the, that's how you learn. Your best lessons are learned from the hardest uh, falls, right? Yep. And so uh, once you figure out how to to, to recover from that, then it, it, you should be uh, able to avoid that in the future, we hope. So. For sure. So what happens, I've had this happen occasionally is, a new growth just seems it grows everything seems fine and then it just stops and it doesn't do anything sometimes it dies and sometimes you get a new growth coming up behind it mm -hmm. what is that even even though you know assuming that the the conditions are normal plants around it are growing fine do you have any ideas about that yeah usually i don't see too much failure of new growth uh, um it's often related to watering uh, where, you know, someone, you know, you that new, the plant and the pseudobulb on the plant is plump and it looks great. You've got a new growth on it and you haven't watered in three months. And so you're thinking, I haven't watered in three, this poor plant must need water. And, and that's the folly of, uh, the folly of thinking that way is that you end up watering and it, you water when the plant doesn't need it. And, uh, you might be creating a situation where, there's water around the base of the plant that the plant's not familiar with feeling. And if the water's there and it happens to be in the presence of the right uh, fungal or bacterial organism, and it's wet enough, long enough at the right temperature, those organisms could sprout and grow and then, you know, rot out, rot out the new growth. And so, um, Usually, if you're unfortunate enough to have that happen to you, the plant wants to continue growing and a second eye will activate uh, on another location on the plant in, in an effort to recover from that, that failure of the eye that, that rotted away. Um, usually, it takes a month or more for that, for that to occur. And then, of course, when that happens, your plant gets a late start and that new growth doesn't grow as big as the other growth and and there you go it uh, uh so the best thing to do is keep the plant dry keep the air movement up make sure it's warm and bright you know in the spring plants sense so 10 million years growing in nature that means the earth has been spinning on its axis rotating around the sun 
all this time and plants have become really sensitive to feeling those changes and now we see them as humans but you know we only live not very, you know not very long and so and we manipulate our environment but a, a plant growing in nature has to deal with what mother nature gives it and so when the days are lengthening the it's getting longer it's getting warmer um the, the plant feels all these things and these are all uh chemical reactions occur within the plant to say start growing growth start growing roots um and don't be in a hurry to water with catechisms just don't don't do it it's um it's not needed and and that kind of leads me to my my final sort of abnormal growth question is uh, luckily i haven't had this happen to me but i see it you know may june folks will start posting online like hey it's may or june and my catechism hasn't done anything um you know, and, and typically, you know, I'll ask, hey, did it get seasonal cues? Does it have access to light, changing day, increasing warmth? And a lot of time they're like, yeah, it's grown next to my other plants. Do, do you have any mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? Is that? Yeah. So dormancy is an interesting thing, right? And so dorm we know dormancy is caused by shortening days, cooler conditions, drier conditions three things so well, a lot of times what you don't hear from folks is that when did this occur if you're if you're growing indoors under lights you turn the heat on it's winter out and you got the heat on and, and how cold is your house in the middle of winter you know is it 65 at night my probably woman. not my, <laughs> my wife make sure it is 68 degrees okay that's pretty warm. My greenhouse for my catastetums is 55 at night. If I had catastetums indoors at 58 degrees and the lights were on for, for 14 hours a day, the plant's not receiving the signals to go dormant properly. And so if you're and and there's another thing about dormancy, and I can't speak to this from a scientific point of view, but it does appear though that there is like an internal biological clock that's ticking off inside of a dormant bulb. And so it needs a certain amount. Each species has its own requirement for this dormant period. But there's also like, you know, it, you need two months of dormancy. And so whenever you start the dormancy trigger begins in the plant, it needs two months before it starts growing. So if you've kept your plant vegetative non-dormant plant into february or march it's not going to start growing again for several months later because that clock or whatever that is mm -hmm. inside the plant has to tick off in conjunction with the day length and the warmth and so forth and so it's really important to get your plants to go dormant in the fall so you can get them to sleep on time so they can wake up early in spring and have a long spring and a long summer. So you can grow big plants that have lots of opportunities to flower for you and flourish. And so I think usually when a plant doesn't wake up early spring is because something, something has fooled it into thinking that it's not time to wake up yet. So again, the real question, the follow-up to that would be is in July or August, what's your plant doing now? And if the answer is, oh, it's starting to sprout a new growth, then, uh, you know, the, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, you know, it's a duck. And so that means it didn't get the dormancy triggers early enough. Um, and, and, and so it just seems it's another one of those issue, cultural issues that a mistake in the past has repercussions in the future or the present uh, in, in this case, yeah. if it's May or June. It's and it's it's hard to learn, you know. That's the thing about orchids, and that's what's awesome about orchid growers, right? Is that we've taken on a, a pretty serious challenge, and when it comes to growing plants, and there's a time, you know, there's a, a when you do something and you see the result, there can be six or seven months of time that elapses, and it's hard to correlate what's happening today with something that occurred six months ago, and so. 
uh, it's uh, it's tricky. And so that's why, you know, stuff like what we're talking about right now, Stephen, and thank you for having these questions like this is really helpful, I think, to help open people's eyes up to this and and get them, a, get them ahead of the curve and recognizing what they're doing in October plays a huge role in what's going to be happening in, in May and June. Absolutely. I mean, the, the whole goal of, of my channel is to help people kill fewer orchids than I had to kill to, to get the same amount of knowledge, you know, and, um, you know, discussions like this are, are, are really important, I think, for, for that and and getting folks to understand that catacetums, are, they're not that tricky there. They really aren't. And then once you get a few timing tricks down, easy peasy, they're, you know, you don't even have to look at them for like three or four months sometimes and <laughs> just leave them alone. <laughs> That's right. You can go on vacation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't have to bother your neighbors with taking care of your catacetums <laughs> while you're gone in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you have to protect them if you do, because your, your neighbors will want to water them and kill them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But so now, now that we've gotten most of the spring culture stuff out of the way, I, I want to ask you about uh, what can folks look forward to uh, on the, the 2023 catacetum list from Sunset Valley Orchids? What, uh, what's your focus for this year? Well, you know, the, so every year is different and every year I'm kind of motivated. Well, it's actually two years ago, I motivated to make the crosses that are now are uh, going to be available now. Uh, the, we discovered a, a, a few years ago with some test crosses about the the power of catamodes, and there was two crosses in particular: Dragon's Glade and Darconium. Catamodes, Dragon's Glade, and Catamode Darconium, and um, they were very impressive. And yeah, so. I, I was gonna say I remember I remember uh, judging Don Giz's uh, I think it was a dark I think it was Darkonium. Yeah, no, it's dra uh, dark no Dragon's Glade. Yeah, dra a yellow Dragon's Glade. Yeah, yes, that's mm -hmm. right, that's right. Yeah, and, and, that's and right. That was uh, really nice and really nice. Yeah. yeah, and so and the quality of those plants, it's like every one that blooms is outstanding. Mm -hmm. The uh, the uh, it's uh, it's shocking. You know that you can that every plant that blooms looks award quality, mm -hmm. um, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so the after I made those first crosses, and we got there was a lot of awards given to Dragon's Glade. Six or seven awards were given, and then uh, the Darconium cross that, that was a year behind. I didn't sell very many of those because I wanted to see them all bloom. And the only one was exhibited and it received a first class certificate. That's cool. Yeah, pretty cool. One plant exhibited. So that's that's how Fred Clark R After Dark was. The first plant exhibited got a first class certificate. And uh, the next nine that went on, I think, did as well. And so these new uh, catamodes, these Darconium and Dragon's Glade, are the next year we will have crosses made with those. And uh, we had a few last season. They didn't last very long. The, the keen hobbyist dialed those up the minute they, they hit, the, hit the website. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some huge potential with, with those for next season. We've also done a fair bit more with some species. I think there's some really exciting species on there like Catacetum evani, mm -hmm. which everyone's like, don't, what's that? Go, we'll go look it up. You're yes. going to be blown away. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, there's Catacetum denticulatum once again, and there's Catacetum tigrinum, which are fantastic species. I think there's also Peliotum on there too. Um, there's a, the new Galliandras, the green Woodyannas. I had those last year. Mm -hmm. They're going to be this year too. And you know, um, there's going to be about a hundred plants of those. Believe it or not, in the plug trays this fall, six or seven of those plants bloomed. Alba. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, I talked to some friends down in Mexico about Galliandra, mm -hmm. Greenwood Anna being Alba. And they go, well, we live where they grow in nature, you know, and no, nope, we've never seen an Alba before in nature. Huh. So 
there was about probably 20 or 30 plants bloomed and six of those guys came out alba so yeah i'm not i've got six of them i don't need any more i have a funny feeling there's going to be some alba greenwood yannas that are going to be out in out in the world and those are one in a million kind of plants that's really cool you just lucked out with those genetics on on your just, plants and just flat out luck yeah that's yeah awesome. yeah uh and it's going to be a broad list this year that we have more than normal uh in terms of the variety of offerings so that's going to be impressive there's a continuation of the cycnoches breeding that we've been doing you know the i produced those ones that had the black the black wings with the yellow and the burgundy spots so we've got some cycnoches that might be getting close to the black sick black swan orchids yeah so there's that's a the, chance the Mary that, Gleason crosses yeah and then the ones with the dark wings and the uh, uh dark swans hybrids that's with right. those too yeah mm -hmm. so those are coming um uh, that that's exciting to hear good. that's really exciting to hear like denticulatum is back on the list because uh, i i want to try my hand at that one again um i had a nice one throughout a female flower one time i pollinated and squirrel ate it uh yeah. Uh, so I haven't been able to find them since, so I'm excited. You know, the uh, Tigrinum is another. They're just outstanding. They're miniatures, right? They're mm -hmm. small plants, and they bloom three, four times a year. They, uh, you know, we're talking about dimorphic orchids here. And so for our, our listeners, you know, you grow catacetums, yeah, and we know they have male and female flowers and all that. And that's part of the allure and the, and the, the you know, fun talking about them and so forth. It's also very frustrating trying to breed them yeah. because you've got to have male and female flowers. And so it's been about five years since I've had denticulatum or tigrinum available for sale because I've just had nothing but male flowers for all those years. And so three, three years ago, we had a batch of plants produce female flowers and I had saved pollen uh, from the males and bobbing now we're gonna we're gonna have these guys again so excellent so buy them while you can because it's not something that you can reliably produce every year yeah that's great um what you know i i asked you a couple of years uh, some some of the the primary hybrids for signa keys that i've i just fell in love with years and years ago i'm gonna ask you again if you have any uh interest in remaking those it was a uh, you know uh gene e Monier, uh mm. martha clark and kevin clark yeah uh, any any of those coming back around you know it's it's why I, I, every time i bloom those kind of plants i think about those crosses um but it's uh it's been hard to want to go back mm -hmm. to those i guess uh as a hybridizer you're, you're also kind of like an artist a little bit and so if you did that art before and, and to want to do it again um, would mean that you have to have something you, unique and special about about it. So it's not an exact repeat. And so I haven't I haven't quite gotten there yet. So yeah. the crosses that have derived from those, like the Martha Clarks and the next the Providence, the hybrid called Providence. Oh, they're just the flowers are twice as big. Mm -hmm. as as those early primaries and they flower three four times a year and so so well i don't know maybe i'll remake <laughs> yeah fair enough <laughs> yeah the the, the cycnoche species are hard to keep alive I, I you know we talked about that and so and cooper eye is his, you know it's tough man it's tough and so you've got to have barthiorum you got to have hair and husainum which is even harder Mm -hmm. to to keep alive as a species and uh and i do have those uh, all of those species but remember why do plants produce male and female flowers large robust plants are female mm -hmm. because you have to have the wherewithal to carry seed pods to term through the dry season and the dormant period so i must confess to you that I haven't been growing my my Heron Husainums and Barthiorums that good lately because all I'm getting is male flowers. I haven't had any 
big, robust plants to get female flowers to be able to make some of those. I would I would like to make Martha. It is my wife's namesake, Martha okay. Clark. Yeah. Martha Orem and Heron Hussein. I mean, oh, it's such it's, an amazing cross. And I just that that's the one I would I would make first. But I have yet to see a Barthiorum female flower or a, a Heron Hussein and female flower. And it's been been a couple of years now. So maybe yeah. three or four years. All right. Well, but before we uh, before we call it a day, is there anything else you want to say or about about the list, about culture, springtime, et cetera? Well, you know, this is exciting time. Catacetums are fun to grow. You know, they're just starting. You know, they've been asleep and they've been just doing nothing. And all of a sudden now they're going to be doubling their size every couple of weeks. And uh, remember, they're, they're very seasonal. And so when those plants are putting on those growths and are in active growth, make sure you're watering and fertilizing enough to push those growths and to beef them up you can really influence the size of your plant. And, you know, Stephen, I know you're, you're, you like science and stuff. It'd be fun for you actually. And uh, to do a test and takes a couple, two very even plants in size and one of them don't fertilize very much. And the other one just, you know, fertilize it really heavily and compare the growth of the two and share that with your, your viewers. I'll bet you're going to, it, 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 it's pronounced the difference that fertilizing can cause and uh, irrigation. And so um, don't underestimate the importance of fertilizing and watering your catastetums when they're in active growth. It can make a huge difference. That, that could be fun. And again, torturing plants for science can be fun and useful. Um, <laughs> unless you're the plant, right. of course that's right <laughs> but uh fred i appreciate it as always um it, your your chats are incredibly informative and and uh i i think we've i think we've saved a lot of plants with with this there discussion. you go that's right and of course I, I look forward to to the list coming out soon and uh I'm, i know i'll be grabbing some from there as well all right go okay ahead. well fantastic yeah. Thank you all for listening in. Thanks for, for hosting me. It's been uh, fantastic. I always enjoy uh, enjoy our time together. And uh, maybe I'll be in Texas and I'll see you next summer. Absolutely. All right. See everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.